Welcome to 28 Days in Yon, where we reflect on our history, our heritage, our culture, and our own authentic voice. And today, I'm your host, Alexander Evans, and my co-host, Amari Johnson. What's going on? We're going to jump right in. Let's do it. We're going to talk about police brutality and gun violence. All right. What's your perspective on that? On uh, police brutality? So you're trying to get me in trouble is what I, what I <laughs> yeah, see yeah, is yeah. happening right now. I mean, obviously, police brutality is an issue. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, not an issue over the past few years. That is an anomaly. Right. We yeah. know that it's always been an issue mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the policing of black communities. It's just that now due to social media and camera phones that it's sort of made more public. Uh, it doesn't seem as if the capturing of these videos is leading to any more justice in black mm -hmm. communities when it comes to is issues and instances of police violence, nor does it seem like it's decreasing the occurrence of police violence. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure we'll talk much more about it, but I'll leave it there for now. What about you? What are your thoughts? Well, I think people conflate those two things. I think when we look at gun violence, it's justifiable, justifiable cause for police brutality. And those things mm, are separate. Okay, I got right? you. Because people who may not be a part of that activity, when it comes to violence, they also are seen as perpetrators when they're doing those everyday life things, like going to work, driving mm -hmm, a car, mm -hmm, and all those things. When we conflate that, then we allow that to become the narrative. Or quickly, we also... When, when one gets caught or one gets arrested, they automatically go into someone's dossier. He right. smoked weed when he was exactly. three, yeah. and he yeah, drank yeah, beer yeah. when he was four. And that has nothing to do with the incident at hand. Of course. Because then you begin to tag that person like it finally caught up with him. Right. Or you know, her. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's almost routine. Mm -hmm. If a black person gets shot in the afternoon by the evening, <laughs> we get a whole record of what they did and what, you know, that was supposed to somehow justify mm -hmm. their killing, right? Uh, but never do we dig into the history of these police officers. I mean, mm -hmm. when we talk about the history of, uh, it was a Pantaleo, the guy who, who choked out Eric Garner, mm -hmm. you know, we know that he had many suits against mm -hmm. him for uh, harassing uh, and, and even in some instances uh, sexually assaulting mm -hmm. black males in public. Uh, within that very district. But we don't talk about those histories, though. We really just want to focus on vilifying um, black victims to somehow justify and assuage the sort of national guilt, uh, you know, by, by saying that they were criminals and that they had mm -hmm. it coming to them. Right. I mean, it's definitely a hot topic. It's definitely a hot issue. But again, I always like to emphasize that this is nothing new. Yeah. It's nothing yeah. that has um, just occurred out of nowhere, that mm -hmm. this has always been, and some even trace it back to the origins of the police as a force, yeah. right? Particularly for you know governing black communities, um, growing out of the the, the patty rollers, or the, the you know those who were uh, commissioned to find and patrol enslaved Africans, right? Mm -hmm. So we can say that their very founding was predicated on sort of marginalizing black communities. If we talk about to protect and serve, well, who are you protecting who from, right? Mm -hmm. Who are you serving and who are you protecting them from? Uh, you know, it's definitely something that we're going to jump into today. Uh, tell me some more of your thoughts. I mean, what, you know. What well, you know, it's, it's funny that you say that. They say, why did the KKK wear sheets? Well, because someone was cop and someone was elected official. So they had to hide yeah, who yeah. they were, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. And I remember that scene in the Malcolm X movie. A man don't run up here and covers his face. Take your hood off. Yeah. You know. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, I, but I think, you know, in all fairness, I think you're right. One of the parts you brought up. We never talk about the emotional state mm -hmm. and the psychological health of police officers where they may be on the psychological pressure or emotional instability, um, instability, right. mm -hmm. where they can't function at an optimal level when they're dealing with tenuous, high volatile interactions, which can exacerbate a situation. Well, you know, today we're joined by Richard Oliver, who is the CEO and founder of the Parapet Group, and he's going to break it down uh, from an expert's perspective. So we'll be back with 28 Days and Beyond. Case. Let, let me tell you about this case. We have another black man that's dead for no reason. Who had a gun? For no reason. Who had a gun? The gun You're was never shown, attorney. sir. I expect that. The man had a gun. Let me ask you this. This is the problem that, that, that I see, and this is something that we're going to have to confront. Individuals who just do not want to accept that there are racist and racial components to these cases. And the fact of the matter is that a police officer would not have approached this gentleman and this young lady if they would have been uh, of a different hue. If they were white, this situation would have never occurred. And so don't tell me that race does not take a place in this case. You're, you're, you're not living well, on the same you, planet that we are. Welcome back to 28 Days Beyond. And we have on us on the set today is Richard Oliver. Welcome to the set. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're going to jump right in. We call this the hot seat, okay. you know, 
Um, but Richard, one of the things I want to ask based on your professional expertise, why do you think that you see a high volume of documented incidences of police uh, lethal force against black um, civilians? There are probably uh, several reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, say that the incidences of uh, the shootings have certainly increased, okay. uh, especially of unarmed black people. Okay. But the incidence of violence against black people, I wouldn't say if that's increased or not. With the advent of social media, mm -hmm. cell phone cameras and cameras everywhere, it's more prevalent and we see it. Okay. Right? But the actual instances of the violence against blacks, I would beg to differ if that's increased. I would say it's pretty much steadily the norm. The unarmed shootings has increased, but police brutality has always been out there. And I guess prior to social media and the cameras, when we would complain about it or talk about it, the blacks are complaining, they're mm -hmm. paranoid, they're making it up, you know, those kinds of things. But it's bring, being brought to the forefront with media coverage, social media. But it's always been there. Just quickly, how come Rodney King didn't shake us and wake us up and change didn't come at that time? Because that was documented. Um, uh, well, we see the... Uh, Scott murder in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. right. He just had a hung jury, and it was one yep. juror, yep, 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 yep. one juror who happened to be the black juror <laughs> who gave him that hung jury. Yeah. Wow. And we see instances, the cameras were looking at it, and there was a bystander walking down the street who captured that. Mm -hmm. The same with the Rodney King, it was a bystander who caught that. Uh, we don't always get the justice, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's delayed. Mm -hmm. And it's not to the extent it should be. For instance, when you talk about the Rodney King, changes come in certain demographic or regional area areas based on the public uh, public uh, mayhem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Rodney King, L.A., they operate since the Rodney King instance, and they still have violences, but it's much lower mm -hmm. rate than New York, mm -hmm. Philadelphia, Baltimore the mid-Atlantic states. It's even much lower in Ohio, where they have incidences in Cleveland mm -hmm. and Cincinnati, where the citizens totally destroy the place. You have places down south. Where, so when you have mass civil disobedience and destruction, mm -hmm. it changes the mm -hmm. way that the police officers and the departments interact with that community. Mm -hmm. Depends on the level of mass destruction or civil disobedience, uh -huh. and it depends on the follow-up. Mm. So, so a march with no follow-up is just a march in police overtime. Now that's very <laughs> interesting that you say that because it's not a perspective that we hear very often, yet historically we would see that that's true. I mean, it's true. the fact is, what, you know, you're referring to obviously Rodney King, mm -hmm. the, the acquittal of the four officers, and then what they refer to as the L.A. riots, right? Exactly. So you're saying that it was the quote-unquote riots or rebellions, depending on your perspective. That shook everything up. That shook everything up. Shook everything up. Yet and still, we're always told, you know, you have to be peaceful, you have to go out there and get a permit so you can go march against the system. But you're saying that in the instances where people took to the streets and made their voices heard mm -hmm. in a way that may or may not have been peaceful is what dramatically changed the way that the L.A. Police Department has, has sort of altered their uh, tactics. And, this, and I'm not advocating. Of course <laughs> No, of course not. But from a historical yeah. perspective. From a historical perspective. And there's one other thing about that. What's that? The disobedience and the disruption was sustained. Mm. It wasn't a week or two and done. I'll give you another perspective. Please. If we talk about, and, I, and I, I'm a firearms trainer for law enforcement and I do civilian training mm -hmm. extensively. So in my class, I, I teach one thing, primarily here in Philadelphia. If Philadelphia and New York are proportionally equal, so if we have 1.5 million and they have 15 million, mm -hmm. proportions are equal. Yeah. So we can go back historically and we'll say Tawanda Brawley, mm -hmm. that farce, and she made it all up saying she was raped by police officers, but the civil disobedience and the marching at that time was 1.5 million, 2 million people marched mm. with Al Sharpton and those guys to protest, and it was based on a lie. Right. All right? So in Philadelphia, we're 10 times less. So instead of have 1.5, we could easily get 150,000. Mm. Never happens in Philadelphia. We can't even get 150. Interesting. 
Do you see what I do? So, so, so let me get this. So, are you you're from Philadelphia? Yes. Born and raised. Born and raised. Which means you lived through the tyranny of Frank Rizzo. Absolutely. So I was a young man though, not that old. But I, I, got, I, lived, but, I, but, I lived through but, the tyranny of Frank Rizzo. I remember when the police cars were red and white. <laughs> but, 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 but so what I'm really getting at is, so even in a city that has a violent history of police violence and dare I say police terrorism when it comes to the black community, also the city that dropped a bomb on the Move organization. Uh, there isn't a, or hasn't been a strong legacy of protest? Absolutely. Wow. And, and let's take it one further. Mm -hmm. What you just said. You say we lived through the tyranny of Frank Rizzo. Mm -hmm. Well, we lived through the tyranny of Wilson Good. Hey, hey. John Street. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Nutter. Mm -hmm. Right. Black police commissioners. Mm -hmm. Black DA. Yep. And it has not improved. Interesting. The plight of the black man in Philadelphia wow. with police violence. Wow. So forget Frank Rizzo. Yeah. These are black mayors, black yep. ADA, yeah. black commissioner, and the blacks run city council. Of course. Has not improved the plight of black man in Philadelphia. Because of course it was, you know, Mayor Good who actually gave the command to drop the bomb right. on the move organization. Right. Wow. You know, uh, we're just getting started. We're just getting started. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. Okay. And, uh, you know, obviously all the things that have been going on in, 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 in the present era, um, we'll be right back with Richard Oliver, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper. <laughs> right. So I guess, you are. according to you, the, the series of killings that have happened systematically year after year after year just happen to be circumstance. Just, just, systematically. Just, just by chance. They all happen to be black. Is, is, that, is that your position, sir? It's I don't just, know about these cases you're talking about. You, where, where, you're talking you, about where do you want me to start? Where do you want me to start? You know, want I, me to start with Miss Bumpers? Who I can remember. Miss Bumpers, you All remember right. her? How about how? Let, let's go. You want to go down Bumpers. the list? Miss right. Trayvon Martin. Right. Mr. Rice. How many do you want Trayvon us to Martin name? Who attacked somebody? Trayvon Martin. How, how many? How many of us? How many? How many? How many cases do we have to name? Mr. was clear, right? So how, how, many, how many? How many? How many? Do, do, do you do you hear yourself? You 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 you're, you're not living you in a reality. You, let me ask you a question, sir. You're not living in a reality. Can I ask you? Can I ask you a question? You know, I have to explain to my four. Can I excuse me? I have to explain to my four-year-old child how he has to deal with police officers for fear that he may be a victim. And I can almost guarantee you. Excuse me. The same excuse me. To my, excuse to my me. nephew. All right. And you know anybody, what? any something you never have to worry about. When a police about. officer stops you, okay. you should Hold comply. On, We're back with 28 Days and Beyond, and we have Richard Oliver back on the set. Richard, we're going to dig a little deeper right now. Okay. Why do you think the blue is afraid of the black? Uh, not just the blue. I would say all of America. Okay. They've okay. been conditioned that way for the 400 years since they okay. brought us here. Mm -hmm. From their constitution, before the constitution, they always said we were three-fifths of a man, we were property, mm -hmm. we didn't have equal rights, and then they took us from slavery to sharecropping to putting us right in the ghetto with no money, no education, and, you know, that and a lot of other systemic racial prejudice has engineered us to be this way and they perceive us this way. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not a thing where you can say that the blue is scared of black. America's scared of black, black scared of black, white scared of black. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, really a worldwide epidemic, mm -hmm. you know? And it's something that needs to be addressed and it can easily be addressed. So it's not just a racial thing, mm -hmm. it's almost like a mind thing, uh, an attitude adjustment, mm -hmm. you know? And it's a dialogue that needs to happen. You, un you understand? Mm -hmm. So when you look at something as a threat and as a lesser value, you know, that's something that's ingrained through them, you know, from childhood on. Mm. And it's generational. So, I mean, even in majority black cities, uh, we'll see a large number of black police officers uh, and it doesn't decrease, the sort of proportion of black police officers does not decrease the instance of, of violent interactions. Uh, not at all. So how is this something that can be, you know, ameliorated? Uh, you have to have the dialogue. You have to have the, uh, better training. And it has to come, uh, it has to be something that society, the population, has to ask for. You know, mm -hmm. not just the powers that be, but the population, the community has to ask and demand this. 
You understand? I, so one of the things that I know, going back, for instance, uh, in the city of New York, going back to Amadou Diallo through Sean Bell, uh, Timothy Stansbury, all these cases that they were talking for a sort of uh, independent review board. Right. As it is now, of course, any all of these cases, the police themselves are investigating, right? But they want a uh, civilian review board. Do you think that would be a viable option to, to affect change? They, they've had a civilian review board mm -hmm. everywhere, but the civilian review boards don't have any teeth. Mm -hmm. They don't have any power. Very few, if any of them, have any subpoena power. And then they don't have any power because the police unions are so strong. Mm -hmm. What can you do? You know, we've seen it here in Philadelphia, a cop will lose his job. For instance, the cop at the Puerto Rican Day Parade who yeah. punched the woman, yeah, yeah, the yeah. lieutenant, and then he gets his job back and with back pay. Mm. And then of course, uh, a year or two later, he becomes a hero. He saves some people from a fire. But <laughs> you know, this is that the unions are strong and powerful and it's sustained action. It has to be a sustained fight. You can't just have a march and then forget about it. You know, it's interesting that, you know, we have this dialogue now. If you see something, say something, right? Right. And, and the no snitch policy. Right. How come that's expected of civilians, but within the police force, they don't, they have a no snitch policy as well. So why the double standard? <laughs> I don't know why, but it's the uh, thin blue line. The or thin blue line, okay. Or the, blue you know, blue, line, silence, blue yeah, wall of yeah. silence. And uh, we can look at that. Okay. Whistleblowers in any industry, mm -hmm. not just police. Mm -hmm. Whistleblowers are like Powerball winners, mm -hmm. mega power, they are few and far in between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you have a whistleblower, it's so few and far between, they'll make a movie about it. <laughs> Serpico, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, some type of movie, uh, it, they'll make a movie the about seven, it. The 75 in yeah, Brownsville, it's, New York. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a very hard thing to do. And the police have this stop, you know, this campaign about snop stitching. Well, I would think that Police officers have a duty to uphold the law. Mm -hmm. But when you're out with your partner yeah. and he's breaking the law mm -hmm. and you don't report him, where is the consequence of you not upholding the right, law? Right, right, right. Yep. And it's historical and it's throughout the system all over. The that, other, that needs to be addressed. The, the other thing is, why are they the sacred cow? I mean, you, you, so I could, so for instance, you know, if I say I believe it, it, police brutality is happening, that means I'm anti-police. Right. I mean, no, we always conflate things where people don't get room um, or space to have that conversation and it gets shut down. Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter. Uh, okay, okay let's, let's address that. Mm -hmm. So you say, I don't know why they are the sacred cow. So like you said, if you say something about police brutality, we are not saying that all police mm -hmm. are bad. Mm -hmm. We're just talking about a segment mm -hmm. of an industry. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. that's it. It's, it's <laughs> just that finite. Mm -hmm. But and when we say black lives matter, we are not mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. that no other lives matter. So in other words, if I say I'm going to do a march for breast cancer, that does not mean that I didn't say prostate cancer yeah. doesn't matter <laughs> or liver cancer doesn't right, matter. Right, right, right. Well, free breast cancer don't matter. Right. Like I got breast and I ain't got cancer. Right. They, you insignificant. Exactly. So <laughs> these things are, uh, I would say, propaganda. Mm hmm. Uh, media, right, and, mm -hmm. and, and and it's a it's a game. Mm -hmm. So how can uh, black communities be trained to defend themselves against these onslaughts, against this violence? Is there anything that can be done? Yes. Well, uh, a few years ago, the Supreme Court had come out with a ruling where it's uh, police cannot expect any privacy when they're doing their official duties. So you're allowed mm -hmm. to film them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So people have to be diligent and good citizen warriors and film police brutality when they see it. And they have to do a follow-up and they have to report it to internal affairs. They have to go to their council person. They have to go to the news media. It's not just post on social media in obscurity and obscurity and let the hits and likes and TMZ and yeah. World Star take care of it. What is going to be the community's role once they see this on World Star TMZ but it's only on the news for, mm -hmm. that, for that cycle, cycle. and mm -hmm. then after that it's gone. You know, because that, that's always been uh, something I've, I've seen, you know, mm -hmm. I'll look up a case maybe six months later and there's nothing, I mean, a complete silence as to what happened in that mm -hmm. incident. The cycle's gone. Um, but of course, you know, the, 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 the challenge with that is even though the Supreme Court may come up with these laws, 
the police are the ones who are enforcing them. So we see even the guy who filmed Eric Garner has since been, mm -hmm. he had been sort of uh, uh, you know, hunted and has been arrested and is now in, imprisoned. Right. Um, we see that in an instance where uh, you know, I'm well within my rights when I'm pulled over to ask what their badge number is or so on and so forth, and they'll say something like, explain it to the judge and take me downtown anyway. You see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying, but I got a better example What's for up? you. You're talking about the one guy who filmed the Eric Gardner. Yep. On New York City on a crowded street, Let's go back to the Fruitville Station mm -hmm. murder by the Bart mm -hmm. police officers. Mm -hmm. That I remember seeing that that night. That New Year's, I saw that. There were 51 were, different yeah, people yeah, yeah, videoing. Yeah, mm -hmm. So that's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So you had one guy filled the Eric Gardner thing, and we're thankful and grateful to him. Certainly. He's a hero, and he's catching flack for that. Mm -hmm. But it should have been multiple More people, people mm -hmm. filming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you see so, something, say oh, man, something. man, pull over. <laughs> Because, listen, my, my thing is, and I don't want to say that police officers are bad, I'm a law enforcement trainer, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because when you dial 911, who's coming to help you? Right. But a police officer. Mm -hmm. You didn't dial, let me call my cousin Eric around the corner, yeah. or Jojo down the street. Uh -huh. You're dialing that 911. And those men and women do a dangerous job. Mm -hmm. But like you said, we're talking about police brutality, and we're not talking about all of the officers. It's just a segment of an industry. It's a segment of an industry. We'll be back with Richard Oliver. This just came out of nowhere. As a matter of fact, we were towards the end of the protest right. when the shots started firing off. All of a sudden, I uh, saw and heard uh, six to eight shots. Uh, it looked like uh, two uh, officers went down. Somebody's armed. Somebody's really armed to the teeth. Get back! Get back! The suspect that we are negotiating with that has exchanged gunfire with us over the last 45 minutes has told our negotiators that uh, the end is coming. We're back with our final thoughts with Richard Oliver. Richard, moving forward, how does the work you do, um, the call to action to impact to change these uh, troubling times or troubling situations? Okay, as being the founder and the CEO of the Parapet Group, mm -hmm. we're an armed security company in Philadelphia, and law enforcement company in Philadelphia in the tri-state area. But I'm also a national firearms instructor mm -hmm. and uh, an international and national law enforcement educator and trainer associate instructor. Mm -hmm. So through my training and experience in traveling the country, uh, I would like to educate people, and I train a lot of private civilians also, but just educate them on the interactions they should have and what they should expect mm -hmm. and what they should demand. You know, mm -hmm. so when we look at some of these lethal encounters, we can always see, you know, depending on what your knowledge is or what your experience is, a lot of it will be from lack of training and failure to train mm -hmm. and what was the best option. So we're also saying hindsight is twenty twenty but these are professionals. Mm -hmm. So the citizen, the victim is not a professional mm -hmm. all the time. You know, mm -hmm. some, sometimes they're innocent. So you have things on your duty belt that people are trained to use or were they trained well? So these are the questions that the citizens and the population and the governments and the administrators need to ask. Why didn't you use pepper spray? He was unarmed. Why didn't you use the taser that was on your belt? What happened to the baton? You were, there were multiple police officers. What if you have a contact officer and a cover officer? One is supposed to be giving the commands to the victim or the perpetrator. Why are you both giving commands and the commands are conflicting? Don't move, show me your hands. These are mm -hmm. conflicting things. So you as a citizen, which one do you do? You're, mm -hmm. you're scared to move. Mm -hmm. But these things all point to training, lack of training and failure to train. So, you know, we talked earlier about what could civilian boards do? They don't have any power, they don't have any teeth. 
So the citizens have to demand these things. Mm -hmm. They have to march, they have to protest, they have to talk to their council people, their governments, the mayors, the state legislatures. Uh, there are many people throughout uh, society that have gotten laws enacted for many different things, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So now it is the, it's the time for us to get laws and legislature passed to combat this. It's an epidemic. You know, I believe last year there were over 1,300 black people killed by police officers. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. <laughs> you know, 1,300. Least, that's a lot. There's only 365 days. days in a year. One other thing in Philadelphia, we'll talk about that they just had the uh, census. There are 277 people murdered in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. The year before that, it was 280. Sometimes in Philadelphia, I'm from Philadelphia, we've had a highest 500, mm -hmm. but we're talking murders. The shootings gotcha. are 1,500 mm -hmm. to 2,000 yeah. annually. Yeah. Not everyone die. So when you look at, you ask me, did the murder rate decrease? The murder rate decreased because of this. The hospitals have gotten so good with shootings, the trauma facilities are better but we're still having 1,500, wow. 1,700 shootings. It's a problem. Richard, this is a conversation Ooh. that we can have for hours and hours yeah. and hours, but we yeah. thank you for joining us here on thank 28 you. Days and Beyond, where we Thanks reflect on our heritage, mm -hmm. our history, and our culture. So until next time, peace. <laughs>